in November the 9th, 2022, 2023. I'm going to be your host, Dana Durnford. Welcome to my site. We got lots of news to get through. It always takes me a second. My apologies. It's a lot of work. I'm a little bit out of practice. So, I'm going to talk about nuclear. And everybody should be aware of the subject. Unfortunately, not very many are. On July the 13th of 2023, a South Korea professor came out with this headline. This was a Young Jung Yo. He's a professor of the Department of Nuclear and Quantum Engineering. His education makes mine look irrelevant. And so he says that the nuclear meltdowns in Japan was equal to about three grams of sugar, three sugar cubes being thrown into the Pacific Ocean. Uh, this is a mixed oxide reactor that is now missing and had decades of reactor cores were stored at the top of the building. And they're just as volatile as a reactor. They're in the fuel pools because they're still splitting atoms. And there's no containment. Those atoms are released into the environment. And all fuel pools worldwide, there's about a thousand, are surrounded by farms that uh, suck up the radiation fallout. And so you've got to be very careful uh, if you're on this planet in the last 80 years. So this is not true, though. That's saying that the meltdowns only released three grams of sugar. And in fact, what he's they're claiming, this is the official story worldwide since this year. This happened 12 years ago, on March 11th, 2011. So the total amount of tritium included in the radioactive water, which is a thousand tanks, is approximately 2.2 grams. And they're saying it's just tritium. And that Japan will only release 0 0.062 grams per year. This was the Nuclear Society of South Korea, a very technological advanced country. And so the official story is that doesn't exist anymore. So it's hard to have a conversation when nobody's willing to be honest. So these reactors obviously blew up. And what they done was they left these stumps, which are irrelevant. They should have been razed right to the ground because, you know, they blew up. And they put these contraptions over it. They don't physically touch the buildings because they're very fragile. But they put And, you know, the buildings blew up, so they don't even exist anymore. So they put these contraptions over it. And then the media to your right is just a fraction of the Western, I say, United Kingdom, Australia, New Zealand, Canadian, American medias are pretending they're in the building at the very top of the building. The fuel pools were at the very top of the building, and the building actually doesn't exist anymore. So at the very top of the buildings, these are 190-foot buildings, 65 meters, 19-story uh, tall buildings. Uh, uh, the reactor cores are up where the fuel pools are at the same height, and there's there's a space above it so a crane can go in. There's these are what they call fuel pools, but they're not pools in any conventional sense of the word. There is they use these types of descriptions to lull you into complacency. This was a twenty um, twenty day or thirty two day model total after the tsunami, so the 11th. But the reactors never finished blowing up until the 16th. And there was more uh, detonations after in 1 and 2. But this is reactor 3. You can see that's completely gone. And reactor 4 is completely gone. 
So they only left that there to put these contraptions there and pretend that they were getting fuel into the building. And they rolled out a lot of uh, experts that were perpetrating that version over there when it actually, the fuel pools, which would have been at the very top of the building that doesn't exist. I have to do it at the beginning of each video, unfortunately, because it's a complicated subject. And if you don't learn it here, you won't be able to pick it up probably on your own. And therefore, you won't um, be able to understand the big picture. Okay, so they picked up um, a hundred and f there was a hundred and five thousand sites where they were storing one ton bags that they picked up, but officially, nothing got out. And so the official story is the only thing that got out was equal to taking 1.32 grams, which is that amount of salt flakes, mm -hmm. of the Malden salt. And if you divide it by 22 times, then one of those 22 times is what they claim they're going to release each year. But the reality of it was they lost everything because the building's detonated. But so it's a very, it's a very confusing story, I'm sure. Well, I'm positive, actually, unfortunately. So 30 million one-ton bags, they're in the nuclear wasteland, actually growing food right alongside the one-ton bags. Now, the food was banned by 14 prefectures. And I think of a prefecture as 6,000 square miles, maybe. Uh, so the food was banned by 14 pre in 14 prefectures by 55 countries because the reactors actually blew up. They had uh, China syndrome, where the, what you're looking at there is 40 times their speed, which is, I think, eight times normal speed. And the whole site, uh, there was they have stationary Geiger counters that max out at 10 sievers per hour. And so they registered 10 sievers per hour in six places. And uh, three sievers is a lethal dose to a human. Okay, I think we're, I think we, we're ready to tell the story. We're going to get into a new cycle. And I just want you to remember uh, the importance of all of this stuff. So 80 years of radioactive fallout, think of fallout as pulsing energy every second. Think of a snowflake and it never goes away. And it can just sit there suspended in the air and it has its own engine. And that engine pulses energy at the speed of light every second. And um, just about the speed of light. And so that'll cut through your bones and your DNA and your chromosomes. And it doesn't matter how far it, it pulses. If it's in your body or in insects or birds or mammals or animals, remember, they're much more vulnerable to the radiation. Okay, so we got some new cycles. We got some crazy new cycles to get through. This was the last poll that we done. I'll get that back on our regular screen. Should the International Atomic Energy Agency, also known as the IAEA, known of course as United Nations, which is uh, rec highly recognized as the military industrial complex with 195 um, country, military countries and all nuclear countries so they're they're the ones who concocted this fable that the reactors didn't melt down and that it was only equal to 2.2 grams of tritium was all that got out of the buildings so i had a poll and it was 100 percent and i'm um i'm very very censored i've been isolated in increments over me over 12 years and I don't really have any support anymore. But I'm still here trying. We have just a small group of people that understand the significance of this event. So we're going to cover uh, nuclear, and we're going to cover Fukushima by proxy. And I'll do my best to bore you. I'm really good at boring people. And what I mean by that is a lot of people have such a short attention span 
through social engineering that the only thing that they can watch of Lent would be cartoons. Uh, diners are hit with a carbon footprint charge in restaurant bills. And carbon footprint was dreamt up by BP Oil. And they had a major accident that killed and destroyed a lot of coastlines, islands, and communities and uh, industries. And they wanted to blame the oil spill, which was an oil spill. They wanted to blame that on you for wanting oil. And so they, they, they promoted this incredibly prolific carbon fo footprint narrative that was picked up by UN. And then the UN was able to distribute it worldwide in a matter of hours. And so everybody started having this conversation with the same author, the same pictures, the same paragraphs. And therefore, no alternative narrative to counter any dishonest narratives. So you're being hit with a carbon footprint in your restaurants and everywhere else, by the way, to counterbalance the environmental impact of eating food. And because there's no one to resist them, the United Nations is running the entire planet at this stage. They just make it up as they go along. And they just chip away at any, um, for the average person's ability to, to be able to take care of themselves and their loved ones. They aim to tackle global one by charging each cover, which is a meal, a dollar twenty-three euros, uh, to pay for fruit trees to be planted in developing countries. See, that's a great idea, but the reality of it is they're not going to do that. Donors can ask for it to be removed, and staff are given instructions on how to take off the charge. It's like it's very awkward, right? It's, well, I, I don't want to pay for a fruit tree in another country. So there's incredible guilt for the average person to say no. And uh, they won't plant the trees is the reality of this stuff. G7 calls for immediate repeal of bans on Japanese food pressing China. And I have uh, been really sick for the last couple of weeks. I've been in the hospital most of the time. So we're just slowly going to try to to get back up to speed and challenge the industry that's very prolific. So G7 is seven of the big countries are now back in the tritium that I explanation that I gave you earlier was that the official story from the United Nations subsidy one of the subsidies, and, and everybody else now, is regurgitating is nothing got out of the melted reactors. Because they know they irreparably damage the ecosystem, the species, and the future of humanity. So they don't want to take the blame for that, and they don't really, they're happy it happened. And so uh, China banned uh, seafood. What China should have banned was not just seafood, but food from, like everybody else, from 14 prefectures. And so the cover story was, pretend this didn't happen anymore, and that is only seafood, and that is only tritium. Again, it's very convoluted. The group of seven industrial powers called on Sunday, and this story is a little bit old. It's October the 29th. For the immediate appeal of import curbs on Japan's food products, what they were trying to do was proliferate the version of tritium. And this was, uh, you see, so Taiwan, South Korea, China, and Japan have worked successfully, I might add, to hoodwink the entire population of Asia, which is two billion people. 
China slapped a blanket suspension of Japanese fish imports two months ago when Japan started, as a key word, started uh, releasing, treated, which you can't treat the water because it's fuel particulates. And you, you can't, this is not like um, food coloring. This is very dangerous for very long periods of time, long past the human experience at amounts that are not perceivable to anything but the most sophisticated equipment. Wrecked, now I showed you earlier the, the, the buildings actually, are not wrecked, they're, these are nuclear meltdowns. Using terminologies like wrecked or destroyed is not appropriate, these are nuclear meltdowns. And we've never, each of these buildings uh, are equal to about a hundred nuclear, a uh, hundred Chernobyls. Now that's not counting the decades of reactor cores that were criminally stored at the top of each building into the Pacific. So they're talking about the filter. They're claiming that nothing got out on either water, and the water they sprayed over it was collected, filtered, and put into a thousand tanks. It's a fantastical story. It's simply, there is no science to support those types of assertions. Uh, scientists warn Earth is warming faster than expected uh, due to reduction in ship reduction, reduction in ship pollution. So this is a twofold. This, I'm sorry, it's actually much more. There's many facets to this story that is kind of out of the lexicon. And I'm just going to, I have a kind of unique way to explain a lot of these. Um, important facets that humanity is coasting on. Here we go. So let's walk backwards. Uh, container ships emission is their biggest problem. So one massive container ship is equal to 50 million cars. So one of these is equal to 50 million cars because they're burning stuff that was supposed to be very toxic. What the, uh, it's the residue left over from the production of oil and gas and other and vinyl and other products made from petroleum. And they're somehow they come up with a way to burn it in these ships, and so which is completely dishonest. It's, it's about 15 percent efficient. So the rest of it is released into the environment, particularly the ocean. And 15 of the ships produces more pollution than all the cars on the planet. And so there's 90,000 of these on the ocean at any given time. There's around 7,000 in shipyards being built. And so 90,000 of them on the ocean with those particular attributes Uh, is equivalent to about four trillion people on the planet every day in automobiles when you scale it up. So if you really want to focus in on pollution, it's this, right? But James Hansen's newest article is claiming that Earth is warming because of reduction in ship pollution, a reduction. And uh, trying to work it out on your own is like getting all your teeth pulled out. The images, by the way, these images shows the skies over the northeastern Pacific Ocean streaked with clouds that form around the particles in ships' exhaust. And uh, they have jets that are doing the same thing, not by uh, burning fuel, but by the release of particulates into the environment. It's called geoengineering and a group of sadistic rogue monsters 
that look like humans but have none of the attributes have perpetrated these crimes upon the 8 million species and humanity. The past five months have shattered global temperature records. Just bear with me here. Okay. I was on the wrong, wrong pane. Here we go. We're back in schedule. So, a new study published in Oxford Open Climate Change led to renowned U.S. climate scientist James Hansen. And uh, we've covered James Hansen here a lot. And he's considered the father of global warming. And just bear with me, I'm having a few issues finding the models where we'll get them. There we go. Uh, this is a great model here, actually. So climate change is 80 years of emissions. The bottom model to your left is 26 days after the tsunami, the entire planet is covered in radioactive fallout. And so think of a snowstorm that covers the planet and takes about 26 days. And the whole planet is one big snowstorm. And every snowflake lives forever. It never melts, it never goes away, and the snow never stops falling. But instead, let's look at it as what radioactive fallout has that particular attribute, except you can't see it and perceive it or smell it, or taste it or feel it or touch it. And so that's pulsing, that's covering the entire planet, so it has many, many other attributes. One of them is it's pulsing energy at the speed of light in every direction for each snowflake, which is a radioactive particulate fallout. So snow doesn't hang around in the air suspended, but radiation does. And it never goes away. And we've been releasing it for 80 years through dumping, accidents, nuclear weapons, detonations, which are the animosity equivalent of nuclear wars. It's the same weapon, same radioactive fallout. And it's assimilated into your food cycle through... Because um, it's, it's uptaken by plants and trees and fruits and, and your water and everything else. And it's, it's literally, you can't escape it, it's everywhere. And it's man-made. Pulses energy at the speed of light every second. And it destroys fungus and bacteria, for instance, in your forest. And so your forest doesn't break down the foliage and the litter. And what happens is uh, after a while, when you get lightning strikes, that foliage and litter in your forest that didn't break down is very brittle, very dry. And by the way, your trees can't take up water anymore because your land gets so dry, the rain doesn't soak into the earth, it runs off. And this is where you see flash floods worldwide on a post-Fukushima at a scale we've never comprehended. Uh, so James Hansen's version, ships move across the ocean to emit exhaust that includes sulfur and contributes to the formation of marine clouds through aerosols, and also, also known as ship tracks, which radiate heat back out into space. This is very flawed science, what he's talking about. Uh, the reduction in marine clouds allowed more heat to be absorbed into the ocean. So he's suggesting, but what he's saying there, he's suggesting this is on, they've been doing this on purpose, and with, with the claim that you're reflecting the sun in outer space. But see, the planet can't exist without the sun. Like you, like, you need sun for your penile gland to clean the toxins out of your brains, for instance. But plants and trees and insects and birds and mammals and animals are 100% relied upon the sun. There's many reptiles completely dependent upon the sun regulating their body temperatures. And that... Uh, humanity only covers a small fraction of Earth, right? Also known as ship tracks, which radiate heat back into space. Uh, reduction clouds allow more heat to be absorbed into the ocean, but the ocean doesn't suck up heat like that. It, it actually doesn't work like that. The ocean is like an air conditioner for your planet. 
and it it's been dealing with this long before the humans came along. Right, and there's been many, many times when it's been much hotter on this planet. And so Hansen should be banished, should lose his degrees and should be banished from all history books permanently. But he's part of this machine. Earth's energy imbalance is much higher than a decade ago, pre-Fukushima. Imbalance is now doubled, and that's why global warming will accelerate, and that's why global melting will accelerate, global melting, the glaciers. We've been covering that with our research expeditions post-Fukushima. When asked if this was evidence of extreme warning we've seen over the past five months, Hansen replied, yes, absolutely it is. But there's another, there's another narrative. And like United Nations is trying to convince you that, um, let me show it, it's better. If I show it to you, it's better sometimes. United Nations is trying to convince you that the buildings didn't melt down, that, right? And they're the ones who are promoting climate change, by the way. But the radioactive fallout from all nuclear power plants were wider creating plumes like this. This one in particular is a plutonium-239 dispersal based on 20 days of emissions, but it's not based upon the meltdowns. It's only based upon venting. And so there's many, many other models. And uh, I showed you one earlier of the Francis model of the cesium at up to 10 million becquels per square meter in North America, a cubic meter in North America. This plume covers the planet in 20 days of radioactive fallout. That is, that's actual global warming. It's been going on for 80 years. And you can trace back uh, the changes in the environment to the nuclear industry's beginning. And then using Simpsons, which, of course, they have Homer Simpson's a nuclear engineer, all kinds of accidents. They start the video off with him with a fuel rod in his hood, leaving work to head home every day, right? And of course, a fuel rod, if you took a, a part of it that big and put it in McDonald's restaurant, for instance, it will kill everybody that enters it every 20 minutes for infinity. So they dumb down the population with you know, Spider-Man, the Hulk, uh, Superman, because Krypton is a very dangerous isotope. Before the reductions of sulfur in ships, the only way to calculate the effects were through modeling. A climate scientist co-authored a recent study told CBC, which is Canadian, I apologize for that, which is likely why scientists didn't see the rapid warming coming. They didn't see the rapid warming coming because you can't see it. you got to look for it. And it's, this is radioactive fallout. And because the official story now is only 2.2 grams of tritium is all they got out of that. Why do you think they're saying something like that? Why did they claim they never melted down? Because it's, it's your issue. Uh, more, more beautiful than ever, Israeli minister delighted in Gaza genocide. And so they're using depleted uranium. They're using depleted uranium in Gaza. But let's exclude the depleted uranium for a minute. And look at the, this is residential. And so what's going on here is, this is the 2nd of November, this story. And so they've intensified their bombs. Now the bombs that they're calculating is bombs that were dropped from airplanes <clears throat> is equal to two Hiroshima nuclear bombs. I'm going to hang on for a second. I just didn't want to get a whole bunch of Uh, sipping noises in here, guys. So the the calculations, <coughs> the 
calculations is 10,000 bombs, uh, 25,000 tons at 70 tons per square kilometer, and which is equivalent twice the power of the U.S. nuclear bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. And when you look at the damage, uh, it's pretty hard, pretty easy to equate that. So I, I broke down the numbers for you, but uh, these, these are the old numbers. It's not counting the 4,000 tanks that are firing the 155 millimeter uh, rounds, which are uh, dirty bombs, they're depleted uranium. So that's not what they're talking about when they talk about Hiroshima, is the depleted uranium rounds. They're just talking about the pound each. Uh, so they claim they got 12,000 targets, but this is airstrikes only. So that's each, each person had the equivalent of uh, 10 kilograms of explosives dropped. So 25,000 tons is 50, 000, or 50 million pounds, but it's actually more than double that now on the 9th. Now, if you include uh, the artillery and you include the, the 4,000 tanks and you include the drones, you include their foreign uh, missiles, and you include all the other types of launches that they're capable of. 70,000 tons per square kilometer. Is, so it works out to uh, 247 acres in a kilometer, which works out to 566 pounds per acre. And the material they're using is 1.3 times more explosive than TNT. So you want to increase the factor of Hiroshima bombs by another couple. So you're looking at at least seven, we'll downplay it, say seven Hiroshima bombs worth of power. They're turning the whole country into dust. And... So it's equal to 1.34 each to strength. You would multiply it. So, so the calculations for Hiroshima was based on, based on TNT. But this is 1.34 times more powerful per kilogram than TNT. So Hiroshima was 900 square kilometers. Gaza is 360 square kilometers. So Gaza is, you know basically one-third the size of Hiroshima and they've dropped the equivalent of seven Hiroshima bombs of explosives on it. But a lot of it was the shells from the tanks. And tanks are shooting the 155 millimeter depleted uranium, also known as Dolram, depleted uranium low-level radioactive material. So it is radioactive. Israel is using bombs with destructive power from 150 kilograms to 1,000 kilograms, highlighting the fact that 10,000 bombs were dropped. And the numbers for the, the harm and the damage is incredible, healthcare facilities and everything else. But they're also using poisonous gas in the tunnels, and so that all flows up into the streets and the buildings and the communities, right? And that they also used white phosphorus. They also used uh, white phosphorus. And they admitted to it, they said they're using it for smoke screens, but it's a very poisonous uh, emissions. So they, you know, the Palestinians, the Israelis, uh, don't have tanks, jet fighters, or navies, or anything else, right? So the question, you know, I think is should Palestinians wear the Star of David? They are the new Israelis, right? They are the new Jews. And they were using bunker buster bombs. These are megatonnage bombs. So again, you now you're looking at like eight Hiroshima bombs worth of carnage. And they're far from... And I mean, they're... they're you got other people there calling for nuclear weapons to be used. It's very scary uh, that they have this kind of contempt for the rest of their society and humanity. 
So by proxy, I guess the most dangerous animal on the planet is a soldier. Japan detects above limit radioactive cesium locally grown mushrooms. So what they're claiming is it's about 100 kilograms, 100 becquels of kilograms, they say is their safe limit of cesium because nothing else exists, right? Only cesium, according to the nuclear industry. Um, this is a xenon radioactive fallout, by the way. There is no models of fallout that show us a tritium. The Fisher story is only tritium got out of the buildings. That's France's model of cesium based on 16 days of radioactive fallout covering the entire planet. And this is France's study showing about a million to 10 million Beckwells per cubic meter of radioactive fallout after 16 days. Uh, they published test results of radioactive substances in food conducted by a total of 14 prefectural governments after the accident. Uh, nuclear environmental cleanup workers denied class action status in religious accommodation case. So the people that were sent in to clean up had no concept of what they were doing. It just shows the nuclear industry has incredible power. Northrop Grumman enhances the E6B Mercury aircraft for critical nuclear deterrent missions. Critical nuclear deterrent. And so this is the you know, you got weapons you can't use. If you use it, nobody gets to cash their checks ever again. You got weapons that defeat the purpose of the so called wars, which is peace. Because you can never have peace if you use that on communities and cities is you know and if they did use it again, what are they going to do? They're going to rebuild the city back on top of it, and they're going to do the same thing as Hiroshima and Nagasaki, where they study the survivors for decades, like human lab rats, and then downplay every facet of the industry with those false studies. Department of Energy takes a comment on disposing of calcine storage bins as low-level waste. So this is another game. Department of Energy's job is to promote nuclear, like the International Atomic Energy Agency and UNSCLEAR and IRPA and the IPRC, the rest of them, finding that certain radioactive waste at Idaho National Laboratories can be disposed of there as low rather than high-level waste. So they just they move the goalpost in order to give the industry, otherwise the industry looks pretty bad. See, And one of the ways they've done it in uh, the 40s, 50s, and 60s, was Hanford nuclear site in the United States had dumped uh, 450 billion gallons directly into the soil. And that was equal uh, to an aquarium that is six feet wide and 500 feet tall, wrapped around the entire planet more than once. So they'll tell you all the nuclear waste can fit into a swimming pool, but you can build a skyscraper right around the entire planet that is multi uh, magnitudes orders taller than any skyscraper on the planet, full of nuclear waste. And that all countries have been doing the same thing. Uh, why are wild pigs in Germany so radioactive? So they're finding a lot of cesium in pigs in Germany from Falu from Chernobyl. And so again, you see these studies, we've covered it for many, many, many years, where they only talk about cesium-137. 
And that's on purpose. That's a consensus. Countries worldwide is promote that narrative in order to lull you into complacency. And they do it so they can get a paycheck every Friday, by the way. And um, so if you look at Chernobyl or Fukushima, for instance, where the food was banned in 14 prefectures for 10 years by 55 countries. Now, the food is only grown on about 3% of the land in the prefecture. And they admit that you can't clean up the forest and you can't scrape the soil surface, you can't chop down all the trees, you can't get rid of the radiation, it'll never go away. So every time you have monsoons or typhoons or hurricanes or cyclones or heavy adverse weather conditions, you move s fractions of it in back into the lower parts of the uh, ecosystem. But because you're talking about neutrons and gammas and alphas and betas, a lot of the foliage is, becomes radioactive. And so a lot of the dirt excrement, not a lot, but all the dirt excrement is also radioactive. And so you're distributing this radioactive, and they distribute a lot of seeds that way, so you're mutating the food chain through that kind of distribution. But what they're trying to do is just downplay it as, and I think their numbers were ridiculously low. Where was that? So the, the wild boar are still too radioactive 36 years later, but they're blaming on Chernobyl. But the reason the wild boars are so radioactive now, and will always be, is we have perpetual radioactive fallout, not just Chernobyl, suggesting that Chernobyl is the only attribute for the radioactive fallout in Germany is ridiculous. Uh, so this model is based on 19.5 uh, days right here in that part of the model of radioactive fallout from Fukushima. And I think that one's based on xenon. 133, I can't remember. Sellafield uses robot dogs nuclear waste management, which is completely dishonest. That thing is not managing any nuclear waste. And if they use it around high level waste, it couldn't stand alongside a dog. It would be too radioactive, it would kill them. And that the electronics in that robot are not able to withstand uh, fuel rods. Um, the emissions generated by fuel rods. And so to suggest for a second that that rod was, that robot, so-called robot was used once it's, and was used in an attribute where it was, management is completely dishonest, right? It should, it should say something like, Sellafield use, and Sellafield is a nuclear disease factory unlike anything else in Britain, um, it also had a mixed oxide fuel meltdown in 1957. And uh, each day there's 8 million liters hemorrhaging into the Atlantic Ocean from Sellafield, and this has been going on since 1957. Uh, and we cover this Albuquerque Museum a lot. Each year, year after year after year after year, many, many, many times we've covered this particular. And one of the things they do is they have what they call science. This is a nuclear science museum and history in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And so they have camps where you can drop your kids off at a nuclear museum. Try wrapping your mind around that statement. Kindergarten through sixth grade can register for one or more of the camps. So they go after the youngest of the young children. They have access to them, and parents willingly give their children to these despicable creatures. D these are despicable creatures. 
Inaugural study completed for potential Canadian ISL project. This is, uh, you see core samples, and there, this is close uh, by massive uranium mines that are already polluting the environment dramatically for many, many decades. And so they found more uranium. And this is the Denison, uh, the original guy, uh, Denison, was maniacal. It's coming from uh, World Nuclear News, so you know it's incredible propaganda. This is a lobbying group. And they found another major deposit. And so nuclear, and what they're going to do is inject liquids into the earth and that will mix with the uranium then they will suck that up and separate it that way and so they're claiming that this is the the safest most environmentally friendly way to get their hands on more uranium the last thing we should be doing is touching uranium uranium uh, they have no idea what they're doing they right they have the complete wrong system because uranium plants the fuel pools are hemorrhaging are still once you take the fuel out of the reactor which is about 18 months now it's splitting atoms into your environment for a billion years and everything with replicating cells is is violently affected by the radioactive um, isotopes that are emitted after chain reaction just give me one second And uh, I, I strongly believe that in the near future, humanity will come to a census and ban this permanently at all costs. It's the only way you can have a future. You have compromised the entire future of humanity and the 8 million species that we acknowledge. There's more species that we're not aware of. Nuclear energy must be on the table for Australia. It's actually illegal in Australia for nuclear power plants. That's in their legislation. And the nuclear industry and the Mineral Council in Australia is very powerful. And these types of headlines show up constantly. And of course, Australia is one of the biggest producers of uranium, high-grade uranium at that on the planet. It's, but I mean, it's only worth about $600 million a year. But it, it can, it's, comp it's already compromised uh, their ecosystem. And they have a what they call a research reactor. And what they make medical isotopes. And of course, if you look at the presentations that are done on medical isotopes, that's completely criminal to suggest these things are medical purposes. And that, uh, so when you inject people with this radiation, the majority of them die shortly after, and it's the most hideous type of death. And that the waste that they have is met what they call medical waste. And so they, they, they want to build in Kimba, which was finally defeated in court, which is surrounded by farmlands, and they bought up a lot of prime farmland, where they were going to dig a deep geological repository. And this is, they want people to continue to farm, and everything is repackaged at the surface, so everything is vented. And so the farms would be a source of disease because that's what radiation is. Uh, they're, they're, the only way to describe nuclear power plants is are as disease factories. Uh, energy is a byproduct of the disease factory. Uh, anything from Nuclear Engineering International is 100% propaganda. They're a nuclear lobbying group also. So MOX used at a Russian BN-800 reactor confirms the reliability of the technology. But that's not true. And so what they done, they used their version of a simulation. A safe operation using an almost full load of uranium plutonium mix oxide fuel and proves the readiness of the closed nuclear fuel cycle technology 
for implementation from an industrial scale. But what they used was a simulation. Or no, I'm sure, maybe that's another story I'm thinking of. Oh, it is so, yeah. No, they use mixed oxide fuel. So the problem with the, uh, there's a lot of problems with mixed oxide fuel. So what you're doing is you're taking uranium plutonium, um, the fission products, the aspergetic man-made stuff, you're aggregating that and making fuel out of it. It's already gone through a chain reaction and it's considered two billion times more toxic than industrial poison the first time it goes through a chain reaction. Two billion times more poisonous than industrial poison. So that's why such a tiny amount is so harmful. But if you put it through a chain reaction again, it does that again. It has that same attribute, but it doubles that. And once you take it out of the reactor, there's no containment. And now it's going to be split, still splitting the atoms, these anthropogenic man-made atoms, and they're released into the environment. And a single atom could invoke many, many different types of illnesses and diseases and autoimmune deficiencies and injuries. How about Kusha condemns, which is the survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, condemned the Israeli minister's remarks suggesting the use of nuclear weapons against Gaza. And, and he's, they spoke out um, very eloquently about the absurdness of suggesting to use nuclear weapons against Gaza. But they did, basically. They're using the dull ram, depleted uranium, low-level radioactive munitions in the tanks, which are not in the equation of the two Hiroshima bombs worth of emissions, uh, ammunition that were dropped from the sky by jets. They have no opposition. There's no anti-aircraft guns. It's truly shooting fish in a barrel. And they've never, they've never fought, a, Israel has never fought a real war. They've never fought against an army. And currently they have uh, aircraft carriers off the coastline from America. They have a navy, a destroyer, destroyer fleets from France and United Kingdom. And so not only are they a coward where they're fighting or they're destroying a country that can't fight back, they're unwilling to stand their ground against any other country that might intercede because they're incapable, right, of uh, fighting. And they, they truly are incapable. And everybody in Palestine should wear a star of David. They're the new Israeli victims. Israel is no longer a victim. Israel is the world's fourth biggest weapons producer they're the fourth biggest misery production machine on the planet. Canada Moltex de-risk innovative waste recycling process. Okay, so that was the story I was alluding to just now, but instead we were talking about the Russia's Mox fuel. Canada Moltex, which is a British company that showed up here in Canada and the Canadian government set up a corporation and it had 10 million dollars from the government given to them. They gave five million to Moltex and five million to the other company, which is to make the small modular reactor versions based on, on mixed oxide fuel. And then that company uh, dissolved. So it was strictly, it was a sneaky way for them to come into Canada. And so they're, they want to recycle Canadian nuclear waste in the mixed oxide fuel for the small modular reactors that don't exist. New Scale was the only one that had a partial had a partial uh, license application into the regulatory agencies. But you're talking about a million pieces of paper. So you know, once you go, once you get your million pieces of paper, the regulatory agency has to go through everything. And then have to say, well, you got to fix this, fix that. You got to redesign this. That can't work. You got to come up with a better solution for this and that. And the list goes on. It takes about five years. And so then, the company now takes that information, redesigns the million pieces of paper to accommodate 
the regulatory agency. The regulatory agency goes through that process for many years again to make sure that it, this version works. If it does work, then they're going to they need a half a billion dollars to lay out the land where they're going to build this stuff because there's a lot of criteria to, for a, a, to lay a reactor or put a reactor on a site. And so it's a very long process is what I'm trying to say and very expensive. So it takes a long time, but three years to do all of that. And then you have to build an experimental reactor. That takes forever because it's never been done before. It's, it's a total new design. There's a lot of complications, a lot of, a lot of redesigning again. And so if they finally get it built, they've got to run it for about 10 years to get all the kinks out of it and everything else. Then they have to reapply it to the regulatory agency, which takes another three to five years. And then they can start, at that point, if they get the okay, now they can get the investors to invest in money to build so-called factories. You're looking at 30, 40, 50 years down the road, basically, before you have a working model. Because what we're talking about is they want to mass produce it. And so th all these attributes, what I'm just talking about, are that's how it plays out. Moltex Energy Canada, which shouldn't exist, and uh, Rory O'Sullivan, which is the CEO, and we've covered many, many times, is uh, an incredible coward. Has announced a significant breakthrough in his waste recycling program following rigorous experiments at his uranium license laboratory. So, mix oxide fuel facilities are not laboratories. You can't call these things laboratories. Experiments, and what they're talking about, the experimental use sim fuel, simulated fuel. You can't simulate mix oxide fuel because it's going to produce all kinds of isotopes, right? You can't simulate that. According to Molex, which is exactly right, according to them, with no science to back them up, the use of cerium oxide as an analog to transuranic oxide is supported by literature and thermodynamic modeling. No, but you've got to produce the isotopes to quantify any of any of the perimeters that you're going to be working with. You can't just simulate mixed oxide fuel. And Moltex's CEO, Rory O'Sullivan, which is unbelievable scum, so these important experiments not only demonstrate the viability of our waste recycling technology, mixed oxide fuel has been around for 80 years. This is how they make weapons. And that recycling technology, you can't recycle nuclear waste. It's illegal, by the way, in Canada and the United States. There are some government permits, but it's illegal. But also reaffirm our unwavering commitment to developing clean energy solutions that combat climate change can't combat climate change by producing climate change. And climate change is radioactive fallout. This is 19.5 days, 468 hours of radioactive fallout. It never goes away, it spreads out and pulses energy at the speed of light for millions of years. Gas, oil and coal emissions don't do that. And gas, oil, and coal doesn't make plumes that covers the planet either. The only thing that does that, the most gas, oil, and coal pollution is the top left-hand corner. That's as far as it's going to travel. Nuclear is the only one that covers the entire planet. PG&E falls an application to keep Diablo Canyon nuclear disease factory on a fault line, nuclear fault on a earthquake fault line for multiple ones for 20 more years and we've talked about this many many, many times the bill came because the state failed to procure enough clean energy to replace the nuclear power plant and we see, we cover this over and over and over multiple times each year for years and years is that when it comes time to replace a nuclear power plant they have they've already got the money to build you know which should be geothermal, by the way, because it's a turnkey operation, as simple as mindless, as stupid. And if you you can, if you took 
just a fraction of the money that you would spend on nuclear and made drilling even better, you can build these things in a month. It's ridiculous how effective geothermal is. And it refuses to get mentioned ninety nine percent of the times, but he said because, and what they do is instead of replacing, you know, building a new facility to replace the old facility, they say, well, they don't do it. They they spend the money on other things, and they say, well, we got nothing to replace it. We got to keep it, and this is what we see over and over and over, particularly post Fukushima. Global spending on nuclear weapons increased to $82.9 billion. This is a disgusting story, by the way, uh, which is $157,000 a minute. That's enough to build a new house every minute on something you can't use, spent on something you can never use. So you can build 1,400 houses a day and give them away to the impoverished, the homeless, the destitute, and they become part of society and contribute to society. They got something proud to be a, you know. Uh, altogether, the nine countries, nine different countries, spent eighty-two billion, three percent more than twenty twenty-one, and which is one hundred sixty thousand per minute on nuclear weapons. United States spent forty seven point three billion. Forty seven point three billion. So it's just insane to consider you're burning the money on something you can't use. And that the nuclear industry, of course, that's a big incentive for them. So it doesn't need nuclear weapons. There's around nine thousand industries in the nuclear industry. It's just destroying everything and everybody's future. It's only good at one thing, as is that destroying everything, every possibility of having a future. But what was even more revolting was he suggested $82.9 billion could be paid for 2 billion people to be vaccinated. It's surreal that they would say something like that. It's just... That's the, the non-proliferation I can. And made that suggestion. Should never support that group under any circumstances. Israel nuclear option remark raises huge number of questions. There's a lot of people in Israel have suggested using nuclear weapons on Gaza. Gaza can't fight back, they don't have a navy, they don't have tanks, they don't have jets. They're the perfect victim. They should be wearing the Star of David, yeah? Never again. As far as I'm concerned, the Israelis' words now are hollow. They mean nothing. They're, it's a coward society. Russia officials joined two other countries expressing concern over the remarks of an Israeli junior minister appeared to express openness. He's not the only one. There's a whole bunch of them suggested it. Alan Dershowitz just recently wrote the same thing. Carried out a nuclear strike on Gaza it raises a huge number of questions. Okay, so... Global warming. Since Fukushima, we've seen this bizarre thing known as supercells typhoons, supercells hurricanes, supercells cyclones. And what happened, This we've got 80 years of radioactive fallout, which has ex ex you know, heated up the planet, uh, killed the, the regulatory... At, um, like the phytoplankton of our fresh water and oceans. And so this radioactive fallout is based on 60 days. Now that never goes away, but that, that never stopped coming out. It's still coming out today. This never goes away. 
And this has heated our planet up. This is uh, it was a pulse event. It's already been going on for 80 years, all the nuclear testing, all the nuclear dumping, all fuel pools worldwide are hemorrhaging radiation. But this was the tipping point. And so over, since post-Fukushima, we've seen a lot, a lot of storms that are coming ashore at 200 plus mile per hour winds. We don't have any infrastructure, billing codes that are built to withstand that kind of wind because we've never seen that before. And the storms are huge. And uh, they hit the coastline and just linger there and grind up the entire, all the communities and forest and everything else. We've never, normally they hit the coastlines and they slow down, right? They don't do that because and now what was really interesting about the Mexico Hurricane Otis, the, the Acapulco Hurricane, they claim nobody's seen her coming. It came ashore. It was supposed to come in at a Category 1, a tropical storm, basically. And it accelerated immediately and came ashore at nighttime, with no warning, at 165 miles per hour sustained winds. Now, you'll hear that, and you probably looked it up yourself many times when it was happening. And so these numbers, 165 mile per hour, got to have a gust a number attached to it, which would be about 230 mile per hour winds. But we couldn't find a single, we did find some people that said 200 mile per hour winds to media, but it was very rare. It was only one or two that I could find. Um, and so it actually blew the furniture it blew the furniture, all the furniture, out of these apartment buildings. I'm going to walk you through a whole bunch of pictures. And I think it's quite stunning. Now, we did see this one time before post-Fukushima, but not pre-Fukushima, but after Fukushima. We have seen it in St. Bart's. There was a brand new skyscraper we blew all the furniture out of the building. But this was unbelievable amount of buildings where we're just, and I'm gonna just slowly run it through it and see. This is a good example where you can see right through the buildings, right? See that? It blew all the furniture away. And I'm sure people, a lot of tourists, that weren't registered would have disappeared too. It was over 100 dead confirmed so far. But imagine how many, it turns, all of this stuff gets turned into projectiles that are traveling at the speed of a lot of bullets at, you know, 230 mile per hour. So I was trying to, and what you're going to see as we go through this is because I, I was capturing it, I was trying to understand what I was looking at, uh, and I understood that this, you know, it had blown all the furniture. We've 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 never seen that. And Acapulco has been there a long time, right? We've never seen nothing like that. And so when you see something like that, and you got to remember that can happen to you now, and this is what we've talked about for the last twelve years. There are these types of storms where they're just going to come out of nowhere, and Acapulco's never seen anything like this before, nothing close to it. Um, I was really shocked. There was also a huge uh, amount of water, ocean, right? The, the wind was so strong, it, it was like a reverse tsunami where it blew the ocean into the city itself. They've never seen anything like this. But this is uh, ending up above 30 feet is wind damage for it. Uh, it's supposed to weaken as it travels inland. It didn't now, by the way. It still maintained speed as it went all the way into the mountains and up the mountains. And so it was a massive amount of flooding, but I don't want to think about the flooding right now. I want you to think about, we'll get to it in a moment. 
how it blew apartment buildings, all the furniture of the apartment buildings. It tore apart the interior of apartment buildings. And we don't we don't have any anything to, to describe that. And so the little videos that were coming out, you were only getting these little glimpses. And you, you're up high, obviously, on a skyscraper. You can see way down. And then you got to look at these other two apartment buildings over there. And so I was slowly starting to find this footage, but it's very difficult to find any footage even now that is clean footage, right? And this is a prime one here, where you can see all the buildings, all that furniture in those apartments and everything else would have been swept away, right? But look how big these buildings actually are. And they were just, no one knew what to do. They had no warning, and all they could do was just hide and shut. All, all they can do is just hide and try to survive. And it turns everything into projectiles. And the storm surge traveled far inland on top of that. And that was, again, you're going to see me, I, some of these videos I went back to, and I was trying to, to get better shots because I needed, ideally I would have just showed you several pictures of each of them, but I decided I'll show you all the pictures I got because I think that tells the story better. And you can see skyscrapers with the furniture blown out. And this is inside of skyscrapers. Just imagine your apartment in a skyscraper looking like this. Can you imagine how many people actually got blown out of these skyscrapers when all the furniture Nobody knew what to do. Nobody understood this was happening. This was, most people were asleep. They thought they had a storm coming in. They just went to bed like normal. It was amazing. Uh, this is wind damage from a storm that is caused by decades of radioactive emissions and the major pulse event 12 years ago. And you can see, um, and you can see um, all these apartment buildings. And let me get in. Actually, I'll get into uh, the other frame because I can zoom in on this stuff too, right? It'll just take me a second to get myself organized. Here we go. So when you see that kind of damage that high up, we've never seen that before. This is new to our planet. And somebody, we, they hid in the bathroom. They didn't know what to do. And, you know, I would have been doing the same thing because you had no time. Your, your, all your furniture was blowing out of your apartment. You wake up and you're lucky just to be alive. And the damage was, and as we get further into these pictures, I got a lot of them. Probably got 600 of these pictures or something to get through. You'll really start to appreciate it more because this is early on. This is the, some of the first pictures that's coming out, and so you also had a huge storm surge. I think some places might have reached uh, thirty to forty feet high. And so when I was starting to see all of these, I couldn't believe what I was looking at, and that's what these people too are saying the next morning was their complete disconnect of how or what just happened to them. A category five. Now, literally none of the media would talk about um, uh, gust, wind gust. But all of them would confirm the same number, the exact same number. There was no, literally no discrepancy. Everybody said 165 mile per hour. Now, you know as well as I do that the wind doesn't work that way. Some place is going to be 185 mile per hour. Some place is going to be 145 mile per hour. But all of them are going to have wind gust. And that's what tore these apartments apart and blew the furniture and people and, you know, vacationers out of these buildings. From many different countries, vacationers that might never be missed, so to speak, right? Will be just jotted down as a casualty that is missing. It's surreal damage. It's it's uh, and it's coming to you and everybody else. Fukushima was the pulse event that accelerated this event. And what James Hansen's story earlier 
is despicable that he would come out and suggest that lack of pollution is causing these adverse conditions. It's so bizarre. And that's how they work, though, isn't it? It literally ripped these buildings apart. Why would you rebuild these buildings, right? Well, why would you go and buy all brand new furniture and fill your apartment back up? Would you do that? If you lived there all your life, would you go out and say, well, let's, let's rebuild. Uh, stuff happens. And if, if you do think that way, there's something wrong with you. Let me, let me reassure you. There's zero possibility you should rebuild any of these apartments. You should abandon the city. I mean, look at this. There's no furniture left in the entire apartment building. There's no, f there's no walls. There's no cabinets. There's no couches. There's no bathrooms. There's no furniture. There's no bed. There's no ceilings. There's, there's no doors. There's nothing left there. Would you rebuild in that? Have you ever seen anything like this? I can guarantee you, you've never seen nothing like this. This is the Fukushima effect that we talk about, and we showed many examples of, but this is the most extreme. You can see right, right through the apartment. You can see right through it, everywhere. The entire building was blown away. It's unbelievable that we're looking at something, anything similar to that. It's, un it's surreal. It's, this is a surreal moment in humanity, in the human existence. This is the most sur surreal moment. We have no comparison. We have no nothing. There's no bar of measurement we can measure this against. Total destruction from these types of winds. And then... 250 kilometers an hour, category five. And it was really interesting how none of the media, because normally they would have their gust model too, right? They would blow in 60, gusting to 100, right? That would that would be typical, right? 100, increased 115 miles per hour in 24 hours. The strongest landfall in the Mexico Pacific coastline. And the first Eastern Pacific storm to make landfall is Category 5. And this thing was massive on top of that. 165 miles per hour wind and heavy rain to Mexico. Yeah, but what about the gust mode? How come they don't mention that? And gust to nearly 200 miles per hour. This, there was any, uh, and this, uh, I got the audio recording of them on this too. So now gust ne nearly 200 miles per hour. But you know bloody well, as well as I do, that if you got sustained winds, and that's what they talk about constantly, was sustained 165 miles per hour. It's gusting 230 to 260 miles per hour. St. Bart's, the military estimated St. Bart's was 265 miles per hour gust. That swept, done the same thing where it swept the furniture, but that was only one hotel building it stripped all the trees off the oil in fact the St. Bart's and those islands stripped when they had all those hurricanes in the Atlantic about I think that was 2018 and this was a huge storm and so it wasn't just Acapulco up there obviously it was all these other communities and but when you see these all, all these incredible I think it was 600 apartment buildings were ripped apart and uh, 250,000 homes were completely blown down. The media was, and I had to scour the media to find anything on it. Look at the damage. It's, uh, why would you build back there? It's, can you imagine if you were in that bid? Because people probably were. It was late at night and I came in, right? It's unbelievable. That's, that's unbelievable. Would you rebuild that your apartment if that was your apartment? You can see right through the whole building. 
Would you rebuild your apartments if you lived in any of these? Said double, because that's obviously double apartments, one on each side of the building, right? Would you rebuild your apartment if that was your apartment? Would you let your loved ones live there if you were gone away to work? Would you feel comfortable letting them live there while you were gone away? The damage is just, it's hard to comprehend it. Now, I was, I was trying to concentrate on skyscrapers. And you can see the skyscrapers in there, and you can see all the yachts blowing up. It was really exceptional that it was just one or two medias that mentioned wind gusts, and both of them downplayed it by many factors. And you notice I got zero thumbs up on my video. Hard cases, eh? They hate me. Because I'm just, I'm just an honest person and they don't know what to do with that. that their brain friggin' freezes up when they... Wait, what? And look at these. You can see right through these buildings. I think it's stunning that that is even possible. Just for one building, let alone many, many buildings. I was heartbroken for all the people that lived there. And I remember just the horror when I was looking at these pictures. Just the unbelievable horror and the heartache and the heartbreak. I, I was literally a broken man when I was looking at this. I was very sick that day too, I remember. And this was supposed to be my next video. Uh, but I was so sick, I ended up in the hospital. Uh, look at this damage, my goodness. Look at the damage. It's so hard for me, it's, it's impossible for me to, to reconcile it. We've never seen nothing like this before. We never heard telling nothing like that. <coughs> Excuse me. I am using um, peroxide, and I'm putting it on. <coughs> In fact, I'm going to use some right now. And if I get a little cough, this sneaks back. And you can use a paper towel to do it. And I'm just putting it, a bit of peroxide on my throat and chest and juggler because it soaks up into your blood vessels. And that gets distributed throughout your body within a few minutes, right? And it solves it every time. And if you do it twice a day, every day, you'll get rid of it. And if it shows back up again, <coughs> just start that process again. Really good for getting rid of, like if you can't, if you got a sore throat and you're coughing really hard, that'll cure it within about 30 seconds, like for five or six hours. And you gotta do it again. But if you do that multiple times daily, when you, when you wake up and when you go to bed and any time in between where you get hard hacks, you'll get instant relief. It's instant relief every time. <coughs> now, if you've got phlegm, you still got to get rid of the phlegm before you can breathe properly again. But that only takes you a few minutes to get rid of that phlegm that's, that was dear. But that peroxide is 100, it's, you know, it's just a lot more oxygen in your body. So look at the damage. It's unbelievable. Everything that was in these buildings was turned into projectiles on top of that. So all the animals and birds and all the species would have been devastated in uh, that whole part of that country. Just the damage is un it's, un it's inconceivable. Would you ever build rebuild your apartment? So. Hopefully that brings that point home that, because I, I know you wouldn't rebuild your apartment if that was your apartment. Why would you? What's the sense of going back there if that can happen? And it's never happened to you before. But the one thing we all got in common is, is radioactive fallout, right? And radioactive fallout has now compromised the ecosystem. 
And they're going to try to blame it on your tin cans, your pop bottles, and everything else. And you see all the furniture blown out of the buildings. And you see all the skyscrapers are torn apart. And if they're not destroyed, they're wrecked. They're, they're definitely hard damage. At first, you've got to rebuild the whole apartment before you can fill it back up again, right? Well, like, you're not going to have any running pipes in that building. You're not going to have electricity running through the building anymore. You're not going to have any uh, air chutes. You're not going to have any elevators anymore. you got to... You literally got to tear the building down to, to put up a new building. You just, and that's done by a storm? That's done, like, would they have built the building if they hadn't known they were going to have storms like this? Of course not, right? A new threat, surprised hurricanes, surprised tsunami, surprised typhoons, surprised cyclones. No, we've been talking about this for 12 years straight. And there's many, many storms. Like, the Philippines had one a few, uh, I think it was 2016, and we used to cover it a lot back then, uh, where it was wind gust at two, it was wind at 230 mile per hour. All you can do was hide, you couldn't. You had to wait for the storm to go past. It destroyed the homes of 15 million people. And uh, the fishermen who lived on the coastline, when it were interviewed and were asked, were they going to rebuild their home soon? They said, well, what's the point of rebuilding our home if we're going to have storms like that? And these are nuclear storms, radioactive fallout storms. So look at this apartment building right here. It was over 600, I believe, of these buildings were destroyed or severely damaged. That building is destroyed, right? That that's that's a destroyed building, and so is every building alongside of it, obviously, right? That's a destroyed building right down there, and alongside of it. These are skyscrapers. Right, all three of those skyscrapers are destroyed. Every apartment, period. So how many tourists are missing that people didn't even know was there? And you got, this was a, f they were flying by. I'll zoom in and readjust it because that might work out. Because this, one, this was flying by, the camera was pretty steady. But all of these buildings are destroyed, folks. It's hard to comprehend that when you look, because the pictures are not that great, because they're from a video. But they're all destroyed. All of this is destroyed. And it's hard. You can't really see all the buildings down below, but they're all destroyed. Everything is destroyed from a storm, from a windstorm. Yeah, there was a storm surge, but that's the windstorm is self-destroyed all of these buildings, is what I'm saying. And it was 250,000 buildings destroyed by wind, not by the storm surge. There was a lot destroyed by storm surge, but there was confirmed over 250,000 houses, homes, were destroyed by wind. And around 600 apartment blocks, uh, buildings rather. It's stunning. And they got no water. That whole, that's a huge city of, uh, I think it's a million people. And they don't have uh, any water, any food, and transportation. The roads are completely blocked up with debris. Everything was turned into projectiles and chopped through everything and destroyed everything else. There's every object you can imagine embedded in trees from the high speed, the velocity that they were traveling. But when this plane, this was uh, a helicopter that done this flyby, and I started seeing all of these apartment buildings, 
I was I I was shocked. I was heartbroken. I was unbelievably heartbroken. Yeah, and very few media acknowledge the word uh, wind gust. Came sure category five, and it just kept going. There's nothing left. That was the right words. There is nothing left. And so people will try to pick up the pieces because they got no choice. They got to wear something. They got to try to find something to eat. There's no fresh water to be found anywhere. And the queries, the lineups for fresh water, sustained winds of 165 miles per hour are going to be gusting around 230, 240 mile per hour winds. So just a single gust. Imagine driving your car, getting in a race car, you're doing 240 miles per hour, and you stick your arm out the wind, or you stick your ch children's arm out the window of that car at that speed. What do you think is going to happen? <coughs> no, it's total pandemonium. So when you've got 165 mile per hour sustained winds, how fast does it gust, I wonder? The fastest rapid intensification in the East Pacific. <coughs> and it just blows the ships randomly up in a corner, wherever that corner may be. Total destruction. It takes an incredible amount of energy to blow ships up like that. Let me go backwards for a second. See all the wharfs up there missing? See all the poiling sticking out of the water up there? And you can see up there, let me zoom in maybe. You can see uh, way up there all the ships are piled up, right? See the ships that are sank up there? And all the wharfs are missing, right? Just the pilings are sticking up. Remember, this is Acapulco, Mexico. It's one of the biggest tourist destinations imaginable. Everybody knows Acapulco, right? It's been there for a very long time. It's never, it never gets stormed like this. It's a very wealthy area on top of that. 165, but what about the gust? Why not put the gust in there? CB, CBS News. The majority of the media, except for just maybe 1%, and they downplayed the, the actual gust. I was just unbelievably shocked. Buildings that are blown down um, there was storm surge there, and don't forget that. Look at all the ships sunk right there. All the ships right way up, lined up. Incredible destruction. A lot of this was wind, too. A lot of destruction. It's a huge, this is a huge hurricane. Oh, let's go back one. Fox is just terrible. <clears throat> Whoa. I got a long way to go before I get healthy again. I think the damage is just unbelievable. It's really hard for the average person to comprehend it unless they find this video, for instance, and they start, then they can start to comprehend the damage and, 
and the enormity of what Fukushima and nuclear industries got done to us. This is Fox News, 165 mile per hour max winds, which is completely dishonest, isn't it? Because the majority agreed it was 165 sustained. So therefore it would have been much, many places would have been 185 mile per hour sustained winds, right? Many would have been 135 mile per hour sustained winds. Boat on not, we don't have any infrastructure that can handle 135 mile per hour sustained winds. And then every mile after that makes your building much more volatile. You can see all the trees that were literally blown away. This is the mountain area. And you can see the devastation in the mountain area was the same. Where it's hard. Let me go back here a bit. You see all the buildings, the roofs of all the buildings are gone like a tornado. So this this is literally a 300 mile wide tornado. Instead of lasting 30 seconds to two minutes, it lasted for hours and hours and hours. And it was actually a category five tornado that was 300 miles wide. And trees blown away. This is very grainy footage of grainy footage, grainy footage. <clears throat> but it does show you how it just maintains power all the way through the mountains too. Because normally they just blow themselves out instead of blowing all the homes. They literally, the homes exploded from the winds. And you can see all the trees are flattened, which is, it was like the Tungusta where the trees were just flattened for a thousand kilometers. And uh, far into the cities was incredible damage. Of course, the storm surge on top of that, it's just my heart's broken for all these victims. They had no warning. The majority of them had no warning whatsoever. And so now the place is just plagued with diseases. It's really something, isn't it? And the army was there feeding people. But uh, they can only do so much, right? Everything was looted, and you didn't have a choice. You had. You're in this major city with a million people. And so they brought in something like 15,000 military to stop the looting. And uh, it was too late, obviously. To me, when I see all these apartment buildings, because a lot of what you're looking at is projectiles went through these apartment buildings. But I mean, look up in your top right hand corner I'll bring it up for you. Look at this apartment. Imagine you lived in one of those apartments. And all your pictures from your family, you know. If you got a baby there, imagine how difficult it would have been to grab the baby before the baby got blown away. Imagine how difficult it was if you were elderly or or injured or disabled. Imagine everything, everybody was probably injured from projectiles at high rates of speed. That's the Fukushima effect. That's radioactive fallout. It causes these storms. And everything is knocked down, so it'll take you forever to clear the roads. All the trees are limbed. And then have a, a storm surge on top of that. I can't even comprehend it. I, I wasn't there, right? I can't comprehend how bad it really was. But I've seen enough over the last number of years uh, to know that this was just life-changing for, for a million people. 
and traumatizing probably for the majority of them for the rest of their lives. And within two days, most of the shops were looted. There was no water, there was no food, there was no electricity, uh, desperation. You can imagine how many people were seeking medical help. That's radiation, folks. And we got 80 years of it released into the environment. And what happens is the nuclear power plant, what, what, why it got worse in increments the way it done was nuclear power plants are producing uh, fuel, what, what's known as the fuel cycle. And once it comes out of the reactors, it goes into a pool, and the pool has no containment, so it's hemorrhaging the isotopes because they're still splitting the atoms. So as time goes by, the fuel pools now have decades of reactor cores, eight, nine, ten reactor cores in some of these pools. And every day, they're, each of them are releasing the same atoms you would normally release to boil water for a million people. So if you've got eight fuel pools, you've got eight million people, eight reactors in a fuel pool, rather. You've got the atoms that were produced to boil water for eight million people being produced each day. So the more fuel, you, the more nuclear waste you produce, the more of this you're gonna have. And this is not a game, this is your wake up call. This is, this is the nuclear industry banging on your door at 265 miles per hour. And when you answer it, it's going to rip your world apart. Literally going to blow, and this is before and after. I'll do that again for you in a second. Let me center that for you. That's, that's an amazing, you know? So that's what it did look like. I'll get out of it for this one. And you notice departments on both ends in particular will be empty. And then in the center, everything is, is it's like it's crushed, right? Hang on here. Well, look at departments on the sides of it. They're completely empty. Right, there's nothing left. So let me do this one more time, but let me zoom in on it. And we'll just do this part. I'll get set up here. Let's do the before and after one more time. So that's before, and now you can see after. That's crazy, so crazy that we're alive to see something like this. And again, there was only limited footage that came out. And I got sick and uh, so I didn't collect any more footage. Obviously I didn't do anything for less, no, I'm very, well I done a little bit, but I've been in and out of the hospital. I was, uh, I was, uh, I still am, I still, not doing that good. And I'm a little overwhelmed with everything. I can't afford the medication, so I've been doing without medication for two weeks on top of everything else. I can't afford to pay my bills because everything got chewed up. And so I'm in dire straits at this stage. This was me um, just two days ago. This was after surgery. I was supposed to get an uh, organ out on Monday of this week, and I ended up with a lot of internal bleeding. So that's canceled for the time being. And uh, 
I went through a lot of blood. Uh, so I'm very grateful uh, just to make it this far. I didn't really didn't think I was going to make it. I'm grateful I can get back and spit in the nuclear industry's face a few more times. I'm very humbled on top of that, to say the least. Um, but I, I can't sit in silence. Um, we just let the nuclear industry do what it's doing to us. A major hurricane hitting near Acapulco as we head over the next couple of days. Folks, gusts could be literally over 200 miles an hour, uh, just up the... 200 miles per hour. That was one of the rare times when they actually used a number, 200 miles per hour. But it was actually much more than that, wasn't it? The evidence I showed you is, is suggesting 240 mile per hour, 260 mile per hour gusts to blow all the furniture out of all the buildings. Look at that. An enormous amount of um, energy to produce that. And you've never had that there. And that can show up on your doorstep right now. You got a tropical storm coming in, but you've never had category two, three, four, five, well, guess what? You're, you're, you're living in a, in a totally different world. Listen, you know, don't think that they're pretending it's ABC Australia, CNN, BBC United Kingdom, CBS. These are the biggest medias in these countries. This is just a fraction of them. are pretending they're in the fuel pool of a building because they're bored or they're just a typical public relation thing. No, this is because this is a, a planet killer. Don't think for a second that the food was banned in 14 prefectures by 55 countries and now that it's now it's okay because it's not. It's the nuclear industry have put themselves into those positions and removed those restrictions. They're not pretending they're in buildings that don't exist. Don't think that they're claiming there's only 2.2 grams of tritium got out of Fukushima during a thousand tanks because there's four reactors that are completely gone. These are two of them. They're very simple to recognize that these buildings don't exist. These are nuclear meltdowns. We've never, just one of these buildings is worse than all nuclear reactor meltdowns in history combined. Just one of these. Don't for a second think that you've got a future if you don't fight for it. Don't think the media won't continue to pummel your common sense and destroy your children's and your loved ones' ability to rationalize and have any critical thinking skills because that's the only thing they're really good at. <coughs> we'll see everybody. We'll see everybody hopefully on Sunday night. And if I'm not feeling it, I'll do it Monday, but. I'll I don't like the industry getting a day off, so knowing me, I'll be here on Sunday. I went through the music and I didn't end the show because I'm not on my game, my apologies. And I don't think it really matters. Um, I'll see everybody on Sunday, have a great night. Hugs for everybody. There's links in the bottom of the description if you can donate, for goodness sakes. Uh, I'm humiliated, so I might as well humiliate myself a bit more. I can't make it without people helping me. And I can't do it on my own. I just can't do it. I'm sorry. And I, I feel horrible that i got to struggle and then try to do this too. It's so difficult because you don't have the energy when you can't take care of yourself. Uh, and there's nothing I can do about it. I have to ask. Have a great night. Have a great weekend. Hugs for everybody. We'll see everybody on Sunday. Take care.